in the group comer, you have probably the only respected organization representing monetary reform in the world. They are accredited co economists. They are capable of standing their ground against the professionals who refuse to even contemplate the issues that we're raising. Monetary reform isn't a new issue. This is not a few people with alternative ideas about economics coming forward saying, what's wrong about free trade? What's wrong about globalization? These ideas have been around, in fact, pre the 1930s. This has been a recurrent feature of um, economic and political debate really since the Middle Ages. And it all comes down to a single question. This matter of the medium of exchange which you and I, businesses, commerce, must use to exchange the goods and services that they produce for each other, on what terms is that medium of exchange, money, going to be available? Sometimes when you talk about monetary reform, people will say, oh, you can't possibly give to the government the right to create money. Then they'll have the power to do anything they want. Well, the whole point is that creating money for a government and supplying it to an economy is not so much a power, it's a responsibility. Because once that money is created and supplied on a debt-free basis, it's outside of their control. It is a responsibility, and it's a responsibility that they're neglecting. To create and supply money is a liberating aspect. We have a national debt of 400 billion pounds. We have mortgages of 420 billion pounds outstanding, and commercial debts of around 300 billion pounds. Now that's round about 1,100 billion pounds we have a money stock of 740 billion pounds. We don't have the money to pay off the debts registered against the, the economy. And this is typical. We in the UK are frequently told that this is because we're a poor country, we're not competitive, we can't match up to the Germans, the Japanese, etc., etc. But America, that poor country south of your border, has a national debt of 5.6 trillion dollars. Mortgage debts outstanding of 4.8 trillion dollars. And massive commercial debts. And they are incapable of paying their debts off. Mortgage debts, commercial debts, government national debts, all of them show an identical pattern in every country which is one of continual escalation. A slope upwards, no sign of them being repaid. Why is it that every country in the world is so significantly in debt? I mean, if everyone's in debt, who owes who? And what about the third world? They've got debts, international debts, as well as the sectoral debts. They have international or third world debts totaling $2.2 trillion. And we're trying to find ways to advise them to get out of their problems. We are advising them on how to handle debt. We invented this debt-based financial system. The astonishing thing is that we're taking third world debt in complete isolation and saying, oh, we seem to have a small problem of debt here. Let's have a look at it <laughs> on its own. I mean, what are we saying to them? Work hard and one day your debt will be as small as America's, a mere $5.6 trillion. <laughs> The reason, of course, that the world is so heavily in debt is that the process of going into debt is relied upon to create and supply money. In the UK, when I'm doing talks like this, I just quote the statistic that we have a money stock of £740 billion at the present, constantly going up, as I've explained, and um, then explain to people that of that £740 billion, Government figures show that £25 billion has been created by the Treasury, by the government. Now, where does the other £715 billion come from? And then I ask people in that delightful rhetorical way you can when you're on a platform, put your hand up if you've got a mortgage. 
And of course, nobody ever does because they're too embarrassed. The whole point is that the other £715 billion is the product of debt. And if you have a mortgage, congratulations, because you're supporting the money stock. From 1960 to 1996, the average debt on a mortgage went up from one times the annual income to over twice the annual income. In other words, if you went back in time 40 years ago, if you have a mortgage, you would have had one then half or less than half of what it is now. And then the debt-based money supply system had been operating for decades. What I'm trying to tell you is that the size of your mortgages are wholly and utterly illegitimate. Not that the, the institution itself is wrong, but it's been inflated. And it's been inflated in a very interesting way. In that period from 1960 to 1996, the amount of money that the government created went down from 20% to 3%. The amount of money that banks and building societies created went up from 80% to 96%. So at the same time as governments were producing less and less money to support the economy, you were being allowed to borrow more and more and more. Building societies were allowed to offer 100% mortgages, no deposit, for longer terms, and that's simply the opportunity to allow a population the collective right to compete up houses, compete up their prices, to the point where you get deeper and deeper into debt. What the monetary reformers of the 1930s said was that if you ran an economy on bank credit, you ran an economy that was inherently unstable. Not only that, you ran an economy that couldn't sell the goods it was capable of producing. Now, if you have large mortgage debts registered against a population, what happens to your disposable income? It's severely reduced. At the same time, if you have large debts registered against commerce, what happens to the price of goods? They're elevated. Now, if you have costs and prices elevated by debt and disposable income reduced by debt, what sort of goods prosper in that environment? Are they going to be cheap goods and shoddy goods? And by this debt-based money supply system, we have introduced into the economy a very, very damaging bias in favour of cheap produce. Monetary reform is often presented as a matter of debt statistics, as if it's something frozen in time that you should look at and disapprove. But an economy isn't a static entity. It's constantly evolving. It's a dynamic. And if we introduce into an economy a bias in favor of cheap goods, it has the most profound effect. If you have an economy where prices are elevated by debt and people's incomes are reduced, that's you not being able to buy the goods that you might like to buy, and those goods anyway being overpriced. You have a bias in favor of cheap goods. How do you produce cheap goods? What have we given an advantage to? Mass production. The best way, the best way to get goods cheap is to produce them in bulk, centralized, and bulk produce them and bulk transport them throughout an economy. We have introduced a costing bias, and it's a defect in the free market pricing mechanism that favors mass production, and that automatically favors centralization and gives an advantage to large companies. Now, the result of that is, of course, that over the years, um, studies have been done, certainly in the UK, which have shown that the durability of goods has been going down year on year. We now make kettles, which we throw away after six months, so we can make them again, because they're cheaper. 
If you make goods cheap, people will buy them. That is, it's almost synonymous with improved methods within the economy these days. Improved methods means producing something as cheaply as possible. You put a gadget or gizmo on it, you put an extra flashing light, you put a sexy lead on it, you give it a new shape, but the thing only lasts six months. Not only does it mean that goods are of very poor durability, and we have to keep producing them to su supply an economy, which also knocks on to transport. It also means that people's lives are being consumed in a pointless, repetitive manufacture and supply of goods. Cars, which used to be produced for 30 or 40 years, now have a life expectancy of a decade. They're the second most expensive item that we produce or buy and we can't be bothered to make them to last longer than a decade on average. It's a hideous waste of resources, and that's why monetary reform impinges directly on environmentalism, the, the use and hu good husbandry of uh, the world's resources. Economics is supposed to be about the efficient use of resources. That is obviously a blatant example of the inefficient use of resources. Let me give you another one. I did a study of UK farming. Now, I'm pretty sure the same is true in Canada, but certainly in the United States and in uh, the United Kingdom, farming is one of the most heavily indebted sectors of the economy. And the pattern has been the same in every case. The farms to go under are the small farms and the medium-sized farms. And the farms that survive are the large farms, which can bulk produce and bulk supply cheap food to supermarkets who sell cheap food of low nutritional value to a population who just don't have quite enough money to sanction better quality goods. Now, can you see that by introducing this bias in favour of cheapness and a burden of debt on efficient producers, it introduces distortions into an economy that have the deepest ramifications. What sort of food do people want to eat? It's good food. What sort of food can the land provide? Good food. Which of the most efficient farms are producing it? Medium-sized enterprises a balance of arable and cereal crops and uh, livestock dispersed around the countryside where people are dispersed. Farming is the most natural and sustainable activity in an economy and yet we now are talking about sustainable farming. Sustainable farming, it should be the most obvious thing like putting one leg in front of another. But we have driven farming to the point where the buyers, suppliers, the, the selling networks, the retailing networks, and the farmers who survive, all of them survive by driving at low cost. But we've got plenty of land. We want good food. There's even unemployment if we're talking about extra people on the land. But we have tipped the balance because of a debt-funded economy. Now that's not the only t ramification that comes from running a, an economy on debt. If you have an economy that's run on debt, you have, there is great difficulty experienced by commerce in selling its goods because its goods are pushed up in price and people have low disposable incomes. So there is a competition, a constant competition to get your goods, the ones that are bought, and others squeezed out. Well, advertise is now essential to any firm wanting to compete in a large economy. Advertising and marketing now occupies, I believe it's 18 to 20 percent of the American economy. What a waste. They talk about making kettles for the pleasure of making them again, and cars, and eating junk food, we also have 18% of our economy devoted to persuading you you want something that you haven't got the brains to work out without having the images flashed in front of you. Psychological manipulation of your emotions, and particularly our children's, is a direct route through you, through your children, to you, to your wallet, to get things to sell. We all go for this. 
And we also, yeah, yes, we must have this, because we are at the, the rough end of the stick, and we accept the need for this employment, because if we don't have a job, we're out of our mortgaged house. So we say, yeah, yes, I'll make that, I'll take a job in that factory, and we turn a blind eye to what we're making, to the fact that we're making gym crack shoddy products, or we're making something quite speculatively that nobody has ever thought they wanted to be backed up by a team of emotional manipulators who will hopefully get it across to the public and keep you in a job, because we all need a job. You know what they used to talk about in the 1930s? The coming age of leisure. They used to talk about it in the 1960s as well. The microchip was going to bring it. It laid off tens of thousands of sec secretaries overnight. But they had to be re-employed. And so we have a spiral supporting the growth and drive of the economy, backed up not just by debt figures, but by the fact that, that since individuals were in debt, they must have a job. And so the economy constantly grows and everybody agrees with it. It's an economic express train to nowhere. If you have an economy that's run on debt, prices are elevated, disposable incomes are low, and goods cannot be sold properly, commerce has one golden opportunity. If it can't sell its products within the economy around it, the automatic the automatic answer is to seek a wider customer base. Send them abroad. See if we can sell them in France. Firms in France, already struggling to sell their goods there, are invaded. What do they do? Let's send them across to Britain and see if we can sell ours there. You have, by funding an economy on debt, you create a pressure to export on all economies. And instead of trade for mutual benefit, or trade in marginal surpluses, you have every single economy in the world attempting to export its unsaleable surpluses to each other. Now, everybody argues about whether we should have free trade or not. <clears throat> free trade in the sense of the unhindered exchange of goods and services between to countries or to people that want to exchange, there's nothing wrong with that. But if they're forcing the goods down each other's throats, if there is a pressure within any, each economy to export and flood other economies with unsaleable surpluses, then free trade is a recipe for disaster. Why do you think protectionist barriers were erected in the first place? It was to try and control the aggressive export drive you cannot have free trade while you have these aggressive dynamo economies all trying to seek a surplus of exports. If a country's in debt, if a country's in debt, how can it pay off its debt? It's got to earn. And the only way a country can earn is to export more than it imports. So the debt-based economy works right through from the level of your wage dependence your lack of income, the goods you can buy, the quality of goods you can buy, who you work for, whether you work for a whopping great firm that doesn't give a monkeys about you, or whether you work for a local firm that's prepared to care for you, it has an impact on all of these issues, right through to trade. The aggression between nations has regularly been responsible for international warfare. Monetary reform is a very, very simple idea. It is simply that a nation has a right and a responsibility to provide the economy and its population with a neutral medium of exchange. Not one generated out of debt by banks, building societies or other lending institutions, but one literally supplied. If you look at the official statistics and read the newspapers, they talk about the money supply. Well, there isn't a money supply, and that's the whole problem. This money is not supplied. This bulk of money, this 96% of credit, is an incident of lending. You might be interested to know how it happens. 
But if someone on the front row down here crashes his car and needs a new one, he'll go to the bank manager, and the bank manager will advance him a loan of, say, $25,000. He will take his $25,000 and he'll go trotting off down the lane to where there is a garage or car sales. He will then buy the car he wants and the car salesman will hold that piece of paper, $25,000 in credit. The car salesman will then go to his bank, will pay it in, and the bank manager will say, ah, new money. It will be deposited in his account and the entire money stock is $25,000 larger. The receiving bank has no way of knowing that that was money that was loaned. And nothing was taken away from anybody else's account in the first place. It was new credit, borrowed, spent, redeposited, money supply grows, and the banks say, that was nice, now we can lend some more. And they do, and it goes on and on and on. With every step, debt and the money stock go up in parallel. In the 1930s, they talked about a leisure economy. And they came up with some many interesting and creative ideas for welfare reform. Their idea was for a basic income. A basic income. Mortgage debt was sort of non-existent in those days, or very low. Mortgages were for perhaps eight years, and they were often, well, they were for 25 years, but they were often paid off in advance of maturity and averaged eight years. Astonishing. Can you imagine that? They didn't see a lifetime's servitude to a mortgage as a norm. They were talking about job sharing, basic income, job rotation. They had a, an acute depression with surplus food everywhere. By then, the economy was, the British, the UK economy was deemed to be wealthy, obviously nowhere near the amount of material goods that we have now. But even then, they realized that at each stage of advance, whenever a machine is invented, whenever a new technology lays off squadrons of people, there should be a choice. Do we want to go on? You know, what do we do next? Or do we just plow everybody back into full employment? And that's why the acceptance of employmentism, I know it's one of the great uh, automatic choices of modern economics, but it wasn't, and it shouldn't be. And we need a structure that allows us to diffuse full employment, because otherwise we'll employ ourselves till we've carved our own grave on the surface of this planet, because the planet can't take full employment. Now, if you take the waste of time that, we in, that is involved in marketing, the waste of time that is involved in making goods so that they fall apart, the waste of time that's involved in over-centralization with having goods produced in Taiwan that could be produced perfectly well in Canada, and carting them and trucking them backwards and forwards across the globe. The waste of time involved in redesigning products constantly, year on year on year. Do we need full employment? We have to think of structures, and monetary reform embraces that just as much as it embraces the supply of money by government. Monetary reform also, obviously, involves complex issues and pressing humanitarian issues such as third world debt. Third world debt was the core celebra of about eight, ten years ago in literature. It's now public news, but third world debt was the core celebra then. Now it's globalization. But they're the same thing, or different aspects of the same thing. Globalization are these large multinational corporations able to dip and choose wherever they go around a planet. And the absolute root of their power is that two-thirds of the globe is so heavily indebted, so deeply indebted, that they have 
to make these payments to the IMF, World Bank and commercial banks and the only way to do it is by exporting. Now if you have a poor, impoverished company, uh, country that wants to export, you will take any company that comes along to you and says, okay, we will buy up your copper reserves, we will contract your land to grow maize for the international maize market. Because third world, debt, uh, third world countries are so deeply in debt, they have to invite and seek international investment. If third world debt were either non-existent or far lessened, then those countries wouldn't be looking to do that. They would be looking to direct their own energies at their own economic priorities, sorting out their own industrial agricult and agricultural infrastructure. It's what they always wanted to do, and it's what they tried to do for 30 years. And far from corruption and incompetence, most of those countries have done their best to respond to the conditions they've been placed in. But without third world debt, they would certainly not welcome the multinationals. So, third world debt is very important in terms of globalization, and cancelling it is the most important thing that anybody can advocate in terms of controlling globalization. And third world debt could be cancelled tomorrow, could be cancelled yesterday. There was a debt crisis in the 1930s an international debt crisis, a third world debt crisis, if you like. In fact, third world debt crises have gone back to the previous century. In the 1930s, um, during the Depression, a large number of Latin American countries, and Britain, France, and Italy, I think as well, defaulted on their debts to the United States. Officially defaulted. Some of those debts were later restructured, but some of them have never been paid. Now that's very interesting, because those debt bonds apparently are still retained by the United States Treasury. And they retain them, and they account their interest as well as their capital. They know they're never going to be paid, but they carry on with the accountancy. Now why? It's very interesting. In banking, you have two columns, assets and liabilities. If your assets, which your loans, fall if a debt is cancelled, as a bank you officially and legally have to transfer money from your own company reserves to boost those assets and no bank wants to do that because they're basically saying a debt was cancelled, I had to make it up. What the US Treasury is saying, a debt was cancelled but we'll pretend it wasn't. Every time they talk about third world debt, somebody has to pay. Either the governments of the wealthy nations have to pay, or you have to pay £2.50 a week, or a year, or whatever it is. And so, you have your consciences attacked. You're not even prepared to pay £2.50 each per year to save the third world. Aren't you bad people? Somebody's got to pay. Well, they don't. The whole point, once you understand money, is that there has been a gross over-reliance on debt to create money. And if some of these debt bonds were, on a one-off basis, cancelled, it would actually contribute to a far less aggressive international economic climate. How to do it? Quite simple. Cancel the debt bonds in terms of their application to the debtor nations. Just like that and allow the banks to retain them as an accountancy device. It's what the US government's already doing. There are a lot of schemes that have been put forward for monetary reform, national monetary reform, 100% money by Irving Fisher, um, funding the national debt of a country on the basis of credit creation by the government, um, compensating balance schemes have been put forward, flow charts by coma, all of these would probably work with a bit of support. None of them will work without a bit of support. Now we have the most crazy and astonishing system of debt financing at the moment, in which every pound that exists in an economy only exists because of debt. It's required in the economy circulating as a medium of exchange. And it's being hunted by every person with a debt that created it. It's being pursued in so many quarters, it's not true. 
because everybody wants to get out of debt. There's a double calling on this money within the economy where it's needed for payments, wages, costs, overheads, circulations, payments, etc. And every pound, dollar, yen of it is being hunted by somebody in debt. Now that's a difficult system to run. And I think sometimes they need a lot of congratulations for keeping it going. If you can stop that financial system collapsing, you could certainly manage a government-produced money supply in a non-inflationary <coughs> way. It's a matter of political will. And it's not a matter of which scheme is best. And monetary reformers have often been guilty of this, of advocating their scheme. The principle is very simple. Banking as a mechanism um, has the ability to flood an economy with credit and drag people into debt. It needs to be restricted. Simple ways you could do this. Uh, restriction on the house price multiplier, the income multiplier that people are allowed to apply on their mortgages. You can't take out more than two times your mortgage, per, uh, your annual salary for a mortgage, or one times. A limitation of that nature, which used to apply in the past. Economists would say, oh, well, that'll throw the economy into recession. And you say, well, to compensate, the government will produce money and spend it into the economy through public services. Ah, no, no, that will cause the economy to have runaway inflation. Well, you can balance the one against the other. And it's a far more legitimate and um, prosperous and potentially a stable form of balance than running an economy on a knife edge of debt where there's never enough money because no matter how much money is produced, more debt is produced with it. The state should be responsible for providing an economy with a sufficient means of exchange. But that doesn't mean that you should go along and say, government, do this, we want you to do this. It's too sudden at this point. This is not being contemplated by economists for decades. If you have a government in power, they have a responsibility to listen to a profession that advises them. And you cannot expect um, a responsible government to haul around its economic policy by 180 degrees in complete defiance of all professional advice. That's certainly the case in the UK. There are so few economists who stand up for this type of reform. And so what I would say is take it a stage at a time. And um, what I've suggested to several monetary reform groups is that they seek a royal commission or public inquiry on money simply to get this out in the open, because nobody's even talking about it. Look at what you're actually asking a government to do. And if it is too excessive, take a couple of stages. Be a bit strategic about it. Because in the end, we do have a professional body of economists, the bulk of which are completely blinkered in their approach. And they, I would suggest, rather than the politicians, are, well, if not the major stumbling block, a major stumbling block, challenge them. If you desire not to have a debt-based money system, and, but you need to have money, then you will need another agency to provide the economy with a medium of exchange. I mean, it has actually been advocated to, to remove number money completely, since that's the product of debt, and make the entire economy function on notes and coin. Because notes and coin is produced by a government, and it is effectively, by an exchange with banks, it is spent into the economy through social services. That's how notes and coins get there. The notes and coin produced by a government is sold to banks. They receive an equivalent amount of bank credit back. It's added to taxation revenue and spent into the economy. It depends how you perceive money. Now, if we reinvented money, and I came along to you with your pigs, cabbages, and all the rest of it, and said, look, I had this great idea. Don't worry about the half cabbages anymore. Put the three-quarter pig on hold. I've invented this stuff called money. And we all sat down and said, look, here, here are your tokens. Go away. Come back in a year's time and tell me if it's worked to help you exchange your things. And you came back at the end of the year and you said, yeah, it's really useful. Saved an awful lot of um, bits and pieces being carried around. 
you'd probably find, incidentally, that one or two of you have prospered and worked very hard. Others <clears throat> may have fallen on hard times or been shifty or are just not successful. One or two of you might have been in debt to one another, but you would have been in debt to one another. But if I came along and said, look, I've got this great idea called money, I'll lend it to you. <laughs> and I lent you all the tokens. I said, now go away, come back at the end of the year and tell me how you've got on. And you came back. And you got on probably just well as well. And I'd say to you, yes, but you're all in debt to me. And I've got an interest charge here for you as well. <laughs> you know, there are profoundly different ways of supplying to an economy um, a, a, a device that is so simple, representative of goods and services, requires a circulating medium. You need a, an appreciation of its different functions in terms of a medium of exchange, store of value, and um, an item for savings, if you like. You need to interrelate those, and then you need to understand or work out how it's going to be supplied. And it's never really been considered. You see, this is a question that's simply been ignored. What actually happened was that there wasn't enough gold and silver, and goldsmiths had already worked out that they could issue more promissory notes than people came back for because people didn't want to keep coming back for the gold and so the goldsmith said well, I'll tell you what I lent me gold to him says on this piece of paper but he didn't take it someone else wants to borrow it I'll lend him the same money and him the same money and him the same money that was never tackled legally and it is precisely the basis now of fractional reserve banking it's a question that has been ignored since the Middle Ages. And precisely the moment that that practice started was when economic booms, slumps and recessions, export pressures, poverty became run. I think it's very important that this um, area of study comes out again. And it's starting to, in several countries, um, it will be a slow process. It will probably take a decade to the point where it is being implemented. But um, I think it will happen this time.